Do you hear me? I'm sorry, my voice is maybe not 100%, but it's the last uh, talk this day, and uh, I guess you have a long day. I also had a long day. I stayed up 5.30 this morning to catch the plane to Madrid. But I must admit, it was worth it. You have splendid weather. <laughs> I mean, in Sweden, it's still snow and minus around zero degrees, and we are really longing for the spring. Uh, thank you for organizers for inviting me. I will talk about wear resistance and wear especially and uh, maybe my talk will not be so scientific as the early one because I'm from industry and well, maybe it will be more application to sh show some examples of the uh, wear failures. But my talk covers an introduction and then we go some, through some of the wear mechanism. We'll, we'll look at wear in engines because that's the main business for Volvo. And we also finally show some results from Volvo uh, in the NanoCare project. Just one slide, just showing you that Volvo group today is mainly commercial uh, transportation, which means trucks, which is two thirds of the company. And we have four brands, Mac, Renault, Volvo, and Nissan. Volvo you can find all around the world. Mac is in US, Renault in Europe. Nissan in Japan and Asia. But we also have buses and construction equipment, including wheel loaders, excavators, dumpers. We're also making marines engines. And finally, we have Volvo Aero, which mainly works with uh, engines for the ARC aircraft. But the trucks, bus, construction equipment, and Volvo Penta, in common, they have our engines, which basically is the same engine from the beginning, but then the, you adjust them for the different applications. Yes, yeah, just remember, Volvo car is owned by Ford since 10, ten years ago, so it's nothing to do with Volvo Group today, although we have still some cooperation. But we'll talk first about tribology. Tribology is uh, what we call the modern science of three things, friction, wear, and lubrication of interacting surface in relative motion. And um, it's a pretty modern science, and it's a cross-functional science incorporating material science, physics, chemistry, and mechanical. But wear is one important part of tribology. And the definition of wear is loss of material from at least one tribal surface. You can, for instance, have a tribal system, and you can lose material between the surface, but the system itself uh, will stay as it is in the same weight if you have a closed uh, tribological system, like a bearing, for instance. And tribology was introduced in 1966 in UK, and there was a, a report called the Yost Report who investigated the losses you had due to bad lubrication, wear, etc. And today, tribology is an accepted science. You can find tribology associations in almost any all countries, and a lot of journals, conferences, etc. But the tr word tribology comes from tribos, which is Greek, which means to rub. Just some short history of tribology. I mean, it existed before the science was introduced in 1966, and we maybe started already in Mesopotamia when we invented the wheel to make the life easier. It's better we wheel instead of having slides uh, transporting things. And also one author said that in Egypt they found evidence of lubricant on a wheel axle 1400 years before Christ, the pretty late. But when we went to more uh, to the Renaissance time, we have Da Vinci, which we all know is a great artist, but also was a scientist. And he did some studies of friction. And at that time, you must remember, the maths had, has not appeared yet. And the term force was not known either. I mean, Newton was uh, 200 years later. But uh, Da Vinci found that if you increased the load, the friction uh, force was also increased. And he also did some studies. He, he added oil and saw the, <laughs> the, the friction was lowered. And then later, 1699, the well, very well-known law, law of friction was formulated by a French uh, scientist, Amonton, which is the friction force is equal to the friction coefficient times the load. And then we had the Euler with the tilting plane, and Coulomb showed the static and dynamic friction. And 92 was a very important 
things with Strybeck curve, which is very crucial for tribology, and I will show it later. And we, and we come to where we have the arch of the square equation. In 1966, the science of tribology was introduced. We show you have some in financial impact of tribology. This is very old data, but anyway, we'll give you some hint of the losses we have. In UK, 1960, they found that they could save 500 million British pounds per year, and it's difficult to know how much it is, but at that time it was 2% of the gross national product. And mainly it's maintenance, repair, and spare parts, which have the highest cost, but also friction losses. And this was also the region for this uh, well-known Jost report. In Western Germany in 75, we also found that 1% of the gross national product was lost in, uh, in bad lubrication, etc. And in the US, they also did some investigation, and uh, you see the numbers, the wear on automotive brakes is $1 billion, and your material losses due to wear for $20 billion. I mean, it almost looks like the number in the financial crisis now. So, uh, but total tribology losses, they claim was 7% of the gross national product, and of course, you can't avoid all these losses. But they say you have potential to save $15 billion with 1% of the gross national product by using existing know-how in tribology. Just was show one slide about friction and one about lubrication, and then we went to wear. And this is more friction for the daily. I mean, uh, the friction coefficient is fairly well known. And in drag race, racing, they have a friction coefficient of five when they start the, to run these dragster cars. And we also find if you have metals uh, test in vacuum, you could also have a very high friction coefficient. And if you go for more, more normal cars, uh, if your tire is on a dry road, the friction is one, but if it's a wet road, it's around 0.2. And if you walk in a normal, I guess in here you maybe have 0.3 between your shoes and the, the carpet here, but if you have a slippery floor, maybe you're down to 0.15. And if you walk on ice, you're even lower, 0.05, or even lower than that if, if you have a thin layer of water on the ice. So it's important to know that the friction is a system parameter. It's not a material parameter. You must know your system, both surface and under which circumstances you have a friction. You, you can't say Teflon has a friction that and that. You must know where, what you are moving the Teflon against. And lubrication, uh, this could be a whole talk about lubrication, uh, just uh, about engine oils, for instance, and additives, etc. But I stay just with this driver curve because we have basically three uh, cases of lubrication. If you had, is this a pointer? It didn't work. Well, in the Strybecker here on the right side, you have full film lubrication and the friction is pretty low. But if you move the surface closer to each other, for in instance, uh, lowering the speed, because there's this factor here, it's the viscosity, the speed, and the load. You move to the mixed lubrication and the friction is lower in the mixed lubrication. But then you have a conflict here. Of course, we want low friction, but on the other hand, we want uh, lower wear. Oh, is that one? Oh, yeah, thank you. Sorry, go on. Yes. Yeah, so I thought it was a pen. <laughs> yeah, here you have a, a full film lubrication, and it's thicker here but, but because of a high speed, and you have a thicker oil and more losses. But if you move here, you have a lowest friction. But if you're in this area, you see on this curve, you have some kind of wear. But in full film lubrication, you don't have anywhere. So for many bearings, you're normally in this area, but now you're moving more and more because you want to reduce the friction, but then you have to be very careful about the wear. And then we have a final end, the boundary lubrication. You have a lot of contacts between the asperities when the surfaces are moving, and the friction, of course, increases, and also the wear. And I will come back in, in, in the engine, but normally, I mean, it's, this is the area you, you want to be in. And if it's only one thing you should remember about tribology is this curve. It's very essential. Wear, now it's, I mean, deep trouble because there is a bunch of wear mechanisms. And the scientists, they can't agree 
how many wear mechanisms are there? And, and by the way, what is a wear mechanism? But many names in the literature, gliding, scratching, plowing, rubbing, corrosive wear, abrasive wear, scuffing, galling, pitting, fretting, etc. And why all these names? Yeah, the thing is that these theories uh, showed up before the scient any scientific studies was done. I mean, uh, trivology was invented in 66, but the tools like scanning electron microscope was, I mean, was I think invented in the 30s, but maybe in major use in the 50s. O'Shear and X-ray uh, photo electron spectroscopy was invented in the 60s, used in the 70s. AFM, even later, um, profilometry, etc. So the tools was not available. And so that's one reason for all this name. We just think uh, what we wear, wear mechanisms is without knowing. And the other thing is we have different areas. We have the automotive, we have the tooling, mining, etc., and they have different names for maybe the same wear mechanism. So maybe you can say wear is a mix of different wear mechanisms. It's very rarely that this one mechanism can explain wear. Usually it's at least two mechanisms. Anyway, in my, my talk, I will talk about five groups of wear anyway, but there are more groups, but there are some of, of, of important. Adhesive wear, abrasive wear, erosion, corrosive wear, and fretting. But scientists at the Ångström Laboratory in Uppsala, they also, they have suggested to divide it in another way. It's the more after the contact. So the gliding and rolling contact is one group. Abrasive contact, another group, and the third group, erosion contact. But for instance, MIT, they have another way of explaining the number of mechanism theories. Well, we look at the adhesive. <coughs> We're assuming we have two contact in surfaces, and we have contact with asperities. And there's a kind of shearing. And what's happening here is materials are moved from one surface to the other. And uh, in some cases, a very good example, for instance, DLC, diamond-like carbons, uh, usually you coat one surface and when you have it in, it in your tribal system, and some material from the DLC side moves over to the uncoated side, and then you had a very good lubricated system. So in that case, it's not necessary to coat both sides. Of course, that's not always the case, but in some cases, it, it works. Abrasive wear, I mean, there could be two uh, ways. It could be two-body wear or three-body wear. And the two-body is, again, a motion, and you have asperities, hitting each other, and you have a wear here. But you also can have this particle, maybe could come loose, and then you have a loose particle, and which will induce wear, so-called free body wear. And here is one example uh, from a bearing in, in, a, in an engine. You see the scratches here from uh, foreign particles. Now this bearing is uh, usually a bimethyl or trimethyl um, layer. So on the top here you have a tin lead layer and further down you have a bronze layer and you see the bronze color coming here due to these particles causing these scratches. But also positive, positive abrasive wear, for instance sanding, then you won't wear. And here we have another example from the engine. This is a cam loop from the camshaft and here also you see, see small, small scratch, scratches from foreign particles. And of course, this engine will work, but this wear will increase, and finally, you will have problems. You could have abrasions here as the clearance between the bearing and the axle is increasing. Erosion is also uh, very well known, and we used to have a stream of particles against the surface. And the particles could be different shapes, they could be different forms, and they arrive at different angles. And if you have corrosion combined with erosion, that's the wear could decrease. But you also have a positive example of erosion is blasting, when you want to, again, remove materials before you paint or whatever. But we also have negative, and one special case of erosion is cavitation. Uh, this is a piston, and here you have a liner. And this is in, in a truck engine. Outside the liner, you have water for cooling the liner and the water is circulating. But in some cases, gas bubbles can be formed in this water due to high uh, flow of water, for instance, or a bad design. 
what's happening with this bubble here, you, it starts to collapse, finally collapse totally. And then you have a stream of uh, water with very high uh, speed hitting the surface of a liner, the outside of a liner. And here the example is hard to see, but you see a lot of small damages here on the liner. And here's another example, a gasket. You also see a lot of wear due to cavitation. And of course, one solution could be to coat these, but usually the best way is to go to the root cause to stop these bubbles to form. Corrosive wear is pretty obvious. You have a low slot. You have a wear of that corrosion layer, and that could go on and go on. But in corrosive wear, usually maybe it could have a combination of two effects, which could give a huge wear and a very bad synergy effect. This is just an example. You have corrosion for itself; it's pretty low, and the normal wear is also pretty low. But combined, the wear and corrosion together could be very large. In some uh, examples. And then we have a fifth group, it's fretting, and it's wear, and also sometimes corrosion. Sometimes we call it fretting corrosion, fretting fatigue, but it's usually between surfaces that vibrates at a very low amplitude, maybe around 200 microns and lower. And here again, they don't have a different uh, meaning how low amplitudes you should have. But the SM handbook has defined it as a special wear process that occurs as we contact area between two materials under load and subject to mean it relation motion by vibration or some other forces. At Volvo, the, uh, the fretting uh, appeared in the 80s. We had a very charismatic leader, Per Gillenhammer. He had his Volvo car. At that time, it was a brand new 760. He was driving around in Switzerland, and suddenly the car stops. And he doesn't know why, and he gets angry. The car is transported back to Sweden and investigated, and they found it was fretting on some electrical contacts. And a good thing, if uh, see you, you see you a problem, you, you, you easily get inter internal funding. So we got funding to do some research on fretting, because it was pretty new. And I don't remember the details, but originally it used to have gold in electrical contacts. Gold works very well, but it's expensive. So they moved to more cheaper materials, and I think that was the reason it was not uh, tested well enough. And imagine today, I mean, you have hundreds or maybe thousands of contacts in your car, but uh, I think hopefully all, all problems are solved. Go to wear mechanism, we have a well known Archer's wear equation where you have a volume of the wear material divided by the total sliding distance is equal to wear coefficient and the load and the hardness. And the hardness, if you have it in megapascal or gigapascal, this K is dimensionsless. And usually for hardness, you can use thickness and Brinell values and just use the megapascal value. So this is called the wear rate, but you also can take. Uh, the other way around, and then you can call it resistance to wear. And to go further, you can introduce a new wear uh, coefficient, the K prim, which is with the specific, specific wear rate of, of your material for a certain testing com combination, and then you can compare materials. Uh, here are some wear coefficients, which is taken from a presentation by MIT. US and, and it's pretty obvious. I mean, the most mechanism giving you most wear is the abrasive wear. It's pretty obvious. So that's, that's a, a high wear coefficient. And the lowest wear is fretting when you have small amplitudes in your context. And then the average, you have around the same area. 
I will not show any wear coefficient for different materials. I think you can find it elsewhere in the literature and also among all the scientists in the Nanocure project. Now we'll go to wear in engines. So just showing show the typical Volvo engine. It's around 30 liters in six cylinders and a power 400 up to 540 horsepower. And that's not so impressive, 500 horsepower for 12 liters compared to a passenger car. But most impressive is the torque, 2,400 newton meters. I mean, a passenger car maybe at 300 newton meters. And what's driving us is the emission legislations. Different Euro 4, Euro 5, you have legislation in the US. And this is typical, this is the most challenging for, for the automotive industry. In Euro 3 for year, year 2000, you're looking at the nitrogen oxide and the particulates. And this was pretty easy to reach. You can reach this without any after treatment. No particulate, particulate, particulate filters, no catalysts, and so on. But now we are on Euro 5, which is, starts in the spring. And then you're down in this red box. Then you need after treatment, taking care of the nitrogen oxides, because you can't tune the engine even further. You need some kind of after treatment. And then it's getting even tougher. Euro 6, which for 2014 will start. You're in this small box compared to this box. And then I think you can't go any further. I mean, uh, this is the lowest you can get uh, you know, for emissions. So then it will be more focused on fuel consumption and also that the car or truck really works, that you have equipment on board for checking this. So this is how an engine can look like. The weight is 1,200 kilos. Here now we come into the piston system, uh, which we have most interested in the NanoCare project. We have a liner here, we have a piston, you have a piston rings, and you have basically three piston rings. And the line length is typically typical 260 millimeters, the diameter 130 millimeters, and the stroke of this uh, piston. It's 158, and the height of the piston is 110, typical measurements. The top ring is maybe the most important ring. It has a sealing function, and it's very high pressure here, and high temperatures. And today we use uh, chromium nitride applied by PVD technology. Earlier we used HVOF. But the PVD, uh, the chromium nitride, is a better material for us. I will show later why. We have a second ring which is not so advanced, it's more as a steel ring, but it helps to scraping up oil from the bottom and distribute it. And we have the oil control ring which is nitride steel. And finally we have a liner itself which have a certain structure to keeping the oil in the must and wear and also jet cavitation as I showed earlier. And today it's due to great cast iron which is cheap material, works very well but maybe it has some limiting factor, and in the future we must go for better material. This is what can happen in, in an engine. Carbon deposits is uh, maybe our worst nightmare. Usually starts here on the top plan of a line of a piston. You have this hard, it could be very hard, this deposit, more than 1,000 vickers. And in worst case, it could creep up to the top of a, of a piston. And here you see, a shape of a valve which have hidden these uh, deposits because the distance between the valve and the top of the piston is very short. So we must avoid carbon deposits. What more what can happen is that the liner, sorry for the bad uh, image here, but the liner gets polished and so deposits must be avoided. And if you increase the wear on the liner, the, the clearance between the piston and the liner increases, the, fuel, the, sorry, the oil consumption increases, and the truck might be illegal because the emission increases. This, the NOx level or the particulates level will be above the, the emission requirements. So piston design is important, but also in piston design we have to yeah, compromise the, with the design of a of the combustion. You must have good fuel consumption, good uh, low exhausts. They are showing important of fuel consumption. Imagine a truck is running 200,000 kilometers per year, a fuel consumption of 40 liters per 100 kilometers. That means 80,000 liters of fuel. Assume a, a liter diesel costs one euro, that means you can 
will cost 80,000 euros per year for driving a truck. And if we can decrease the fuel consumption 1%, it saves 800 euros. But it sounds, does not maybe sound so much, but for the truck owner it's very important because uh, it's the biggest cost for, his, for the owner is the, the fuel cost. Then he has, of course, the driver's salary and the depreciation of the truck. And we hear the time is running out, but we here we just show again the importance of material. Here we have a standard liner and a, a ring wear for the standard ring and the PVD ring. And by introducing the PVD ring, we have much lower wear on the ring. But also on the liner, the wear is lower for the PVD compared to the standard liner. So we show that by using good tribology, you can reduce wear on both. The PVD is a pretty hard material. It's a basic chromium nitride. It's 1,200 liquors. Also, the honing of the liners is, is also a whole science itself. Today, we use a plateau honing, creating these scratches for keeping the oil to so have a good lubrication in the complete piston system. Now, what we've always done in non care, we have coat liners for less wear and less friction we are hoping for. So these are the liners. And the liners were coated at IFPB in Stuttgart. And they were honed, after coating, they were honed at, at the third part, part, partner. We have this device going into the liner and make these scratches. And after honing, the scratches could look like this. This is different magnifications. And then we cut uh, the liners in test specimens for testing, internal testing in tribometer. Could look like this. Here in you have a piece of liner and then you have a ring. And this, this is kind of a loudspeaker. And then when it's moving and you have the oil box, you're testing the wear of the different materials, especially the different liners. And the best candidates will go on for engine testing. Here are the materials we have. First, we have a cast gray iron as a baseline, and when we have four, co four alloy or four different coatings. And you see the big difference here, the cast gray iron I only have a hardness of 300, but all the others is pretty hard, 800 up to 1,000. And for us, I mean, 1,000 feet is a bit too hard, even if it line, the, the ring is pretty hard, 1,200 up to 1,500. We want as low as possible. So maybe 800 could work. Here's some picture taken by IFKB in Stuttgart and showing uh, some of these materials. And you realize none of these, of these two are known materials. All particles are bigger than my, one, one micrometer. This is 10, five micrometers. And the reason was the nano materials was very expensive. It was not uh, ready at the time of the coating. So we had to take what was what we can find, because you also need for each line, and maybe you need 100 grams of uh, nano powders to coat them. Uh, for, but this material, we have at least some titanium oxide which has a 40 nanometer size. So that's what we can say is a nano material. The coating thickness, uh, usually we coated them thicker, around uh, 250 microns. And then after the honing, you were down to 150 microns thickness of a layer. And this is the cross section showing the layer here, and here's the cast iron. And the coating from the top of the line is down 200 millimeters. It was not possible to de go further because of the diameter length um, ratio. This is the testing device. Again, we have a piston ring here and a piece of liner here. And it's here in this case, the liner is, sorry, the liner is moving. And we have a stroke around 40 millimeters and a speed up to 30 hertz. And here, uh, this the movie is not working. I think you've seen the movie this morning. But this is the rig uh, moving, and uh, this is the excentral uh, engine. And here you have a line, sorry, the ring, and here you have a liner. And uh, now it's running at pretty low speed, and then we can increase the speed. I think it's 20 hertz, and then it goes up to 30 hertz. 
this is rig is our own development. It's, it's not possible to buy uh, rigs like, uh, well, there are rigs on the market, but uh, they didn't have all this performance we are asking for. So how do I come back? <laughs> Stop this. Oh. So here again, here I have a ring, here I have a cartridge pieces. This is before testing and that after the testing, and here you see the wear area. You still see that we have a scratches left. And here by preflometry, you can see the surface between, you notice the scale between zero and six micrometers, and here between zero and three micrometers. That's after we're aware, but we still have the scratches, and we still want the scratches. And, sorry, should have it in presentation mode. <laughs> And here we have a, the, the wear, the average depth of wear. Here's the reference, the gray cast iron. Here's the nano free, we have a huge spread. And here we have two, the two other materials. We had a fourth material from Stuttgart, but during the honing process, it didn't work, it failed. We had a lot of smearing. So we, we added a com commercial coating from another project. This, here you can think why this spread. It's because it's from complete coated liners and you have residual stresses. And when we cut up the liners, for the normal liner it was no problem, but for some of these it was losing its shape. And uh, of course it was measured and then tested, but then the shape was changed during testing. So you have a huge spread of the wear, so it's hard to say what, what is the average is here, but the spread is so high. The other was more uh, lucky. So we, you see here, we're low, anyway, we're low wear of, of a coated materials, but that's pretty, pretty obvious because this material is much uh, uh, softer. We look in detail of the top three here. You see the titanium oxide have a lowest wear. The commercial has higher and this is here. But the explanation is not necessarily the, the material properties. It could have to do with surface roughness. We try to hone them to the same parameter, the same surface roughness. And here you have an RA value, which is not the best surface parameter, but anyway, anyway shows the indication. And here you have a baseline before and after test. You have some wear running in, which is pretty normal. And here you have a coated materials. The wear before and after is very low. And you also see the the roughness of this material from beginning is lower compared to this. And that has to do with the um, honing process. It was not possible, it was difficult to get deeper scratches to get this. So that's, uh, so I guess the result is mainly due to surface roughness. We can also look at it another parameter, the RK, which is a better value. And here you see s small differences between before and after wear in the middle of the surface and the complete stroke. And again, they are in the same order, these. We also try to look at the friction because we want low fuel consumption. And here we see the, the chromium carbide and the commercial has the lowest friction, but that could be explained by the surface roughness. The titanium oxide, the only non material, have a friction in the same order as these materials. But it could have to do with a surface structure. It, this was slightly rougher than these ones. So finally, we will go for engine testing. And this is a single cylinder engine, engine at Volvo. And uh, the engine tests are ongoing. And we run a baseline, the Kuma carbide with low friction. And then we'll run a second coating we had discussions about the titanium oxide or the commercial material. But all the results will be presented at next meeting in Oviedo. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>